Hello, uh, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. Um, we are going to be covering today how, what's the, the role of open source in the LLMs community. Uh, this is going to be mainly two points, uh, the role of open source in the development, and then how you can expand the capabilities of your LLM tools with the most common open source libraries. Uh, we are Antonio and Pablo. You can see that <laughs> we weren't that smiling that day in the mountains. Uh, we are a data engineer and data scientist for Elasta Cloud. Elasta Cloud is a data consultancy uh, based in London. Um, we work on um, a lot of different industries from finance to, uh, to retailer. Um, uh, well, uh, lately. Yeah, yeah. so. Um Basically, Elastic Cloud Traditionally has been a data engineering company, but for this last year, we have been focusing a lot in LLMs and, well, OpenAI with Azure OpenAI, since we are Microsoft partners, but um, we really have worked with all the ecosystem, have seen how it has evolved. So this is a bit of our experience with it. So these are the main points that we want to cover in this uh, talk. Uh, first, we are going to to talk a bit about the LLM development from the developer point of view, but also from the historical point of view. Uh, talk a bit about open source LLMs, private LLMs, and a bit of the conflict that there is. Um, um, public um, private development of, uh, of those LLMs, and a bit of the community effort. What problems uh, have the community found, and what problems they have solved. Um, what libraries have appeared there. And we will show a bit of a few examples um, while we go. All right. So the first thing we want to talk about is how, uh, despite the later uh, popularity of ChatGPT and LLMs this year, this is not something that uh, fall out of a tree uh, the, uh, on January. This is an ongoing effort that has been uh, whole, wholeheartedly supported by the open source community. Um, but as you can see in this diagram, every single LLM that is uh, open source is uh, shaded. And, well, uh, the breakthrough was with the Attention is All You Need paper, which marked the, the transition from encoder only to encoder decoder. Uh, so as you can see, that branch is almost not that good right now, but all that powerful branch of decoder only and encoder decoder uh, has its roots on 2019, 2018. Um, and throughout all this process, uh, open source community was involved on it, and all the models were uh, published in an open source way. Um, here in this uh, graphics, you can see that despite that, the breakthrough was uh, achieved by OpenAI at the beginning of the year, last, of the la uh, last month of last year. And they, they performed this marketing stunt where ChatGPT would be all over the place and in the common public. And now it looks like they kind of are the owners of this technology and the sole responsible of it. But our point here is, and it has been discussed in this summit already, um, well, uh, these are, sorry, these are the groundbreaking papers just to uh, illustrate uh, our point. It's not something from last year, but it comes from uh, six years ago. Those are public research uh, papers. You can read about them. Um, so it's not uh, the intellectual property of only one company, but uh, they make the breakthrough, they make the marketing stunt, and now, uh, let's Get back to that one. Now what they are talking about is about the dangers of these uh, LLMs. They want to sway the public to a point where it looks like these AI tools are dangerous and need to be regulated, and they want to keep the open source community and other potential competitors out of the, out of the scene, um, which is something that is the, the real risk since we will lose the actual uh, public scrutiny and uh, or opinion and the, the democratization of the of the software. Um, yeah. So even even though that's what's happening with OpenAI, there are a lot of companies that are putting um, their money in open source and their efforts in open source. So you have companies like Hugging Face, Llama Index, that have um, uh, got 
millions of funding to mm. develop this ecosystem and these tools and platforms. You have models like, and it's very important that the open source models um, uh, go with hand with the commercial. For, so you have, for example, the MPT that is from Mosaic, that is a uh, uh, it's a model uh, now owned by Databricks. We have worked a lot with them. Um, it gives you the option to use it in your commercial products. That is something that wasn't there with Llama as an example. Llama is for non-commercial use only. So that way you have also the option to go from open source to, uh, to commercial available. So let me go back a slide that we skip. So this is just some examples of different models. So you have uh, Llama 2 by Meta. You have this, uh, the Flam T5, that is from the encoder decoder branch. Um, but you have here a few others. So MPT is the one that, um, that is from Mosaic that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But you have this, and you have a lot of other, um, other models that you can choose depending on your use case. So Falcon is mm -hmm. also one that is, um, uh, that is quite widespread right now. Um, so let's talk a bit about the ecosystem that has grown around LLM. So <laughs> LLMs, in the end, is just a, a model. So you give it an input, and it gives you an output. Uh, so to do things with it, there has been um, a whole ecosystem that has grown around it. So you have developer tools for prompt engineering, like different patterns, uh, chain of thoughts, tree of thoughts. You have orchestration frameworks, things like uh, Llama Index, Langchain, that have um, appeared there to make it easier and to also implement these, these research ideas that uh, we will see it later, but things like tree of thoughts. So there is a research paper on it, and then Llama Index or Langchain go and implement it. Um, you have tools like vector databases, uh, API, um, like platforms that host those models. So there is a whole ecosystem. We are going to touch a bit of uh, this ecosystem and why they, they appear here, but it's much bigger than this. Uh, if you have seen the Gen AI uh, slides, uh, you will see that they have a huge open source ecosystem, and that's only the open source side. Mm. Yeah. This is based on our personal experience while uh, applying LLMs in the industry, and these are the, well, the, 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 the solutions that we have found useful. There are a lot more up there. If we miss anyone, just <laughs> forgive us. Um, so let's talk about the first issue we always find when working with LLMs is the context window. Uh, you have a chatbot that, that's very easy to, to uh, have a properly uh, useful context window since you only need a few sentences to be the, the, uh, the context of your, of your, uh, of your LLM. However, uh, soon uh, the outcome all over the place asking for summaries from long documents and data mining from unstructured data. Uh, we quickly found that 4K tokens limit that's between the answer and the actual prompt of the, of the model was it going to be enough. And even though that some companies, check, uh, OpenAI for example, reacted very quickly to that, uh, releasing uh, GPT uh, models that are that have a 16K tokens uh, context window. Uh, we also found that those models usually are way worse on their output when uh, asked about a specific task, since they are generalistic and they lose the concentration. Um, again, the example is data mining. We were having a solution with where I would just track uh, key data from a text, and um, when getting into a model with more uh, tokens input uh, limitation, it would not be performing uh, up to the same uh, quality. So one solution we found for that is actually one is to make embeddings. Embeddings, uh, well, we'll go through them. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with them. Embeddings is the vectorial representation of uh, text. As an example here, you can see how a very, uh, whole, from a small corpus, uh, Two different centers would be codified, but you can go ahead and with LLMs, with these embeddings are uh, a vectorial representation of a very big subject, a whole broad subject. Um, then you can use that to uh, find closest uh, or similar subjects. Uh, in this uh, cloud, we can see all the like five uh, thousand uh, Wikipedia articles, and you can see if you select machine learning you will get uh, from the Cosine Similarity uh, 
um, criteria, you will get which articles are closer in meaning. That's uh, so much learning would be closer to artificial neural network, recurrent neural network, etc. That means that you can now give uh, a tool, uh, which is in this case uh, the one we used was uh, Lama Index. You can give, you can have a tool that will uh, make chunks of your text. Take, uh, make an embedding of each of the paragraphs, compare them all, and then if you are asking a prompt to the LLM, in this case, it would make an embedding of that prompt, compare with all the chunks of the text, which are in a sliding window that overlaps, and then only fit the model with the relevant chunks of the document. Uh, so the, the LLM doesn't have to include the whole uh, text, but rather where it, he is going or it is going to find the actual answer that we are looking for. Yep, so uh, as Antonio said, Lama Index is one of the indexing tools. So this is one of the ones that we are more familiar because, um, I mean, we started at the start of this year working uh, a lot with LLMs, and this, one, this was one of the first ones that did indexing very well. Um, so they have integration with a lot of open source and closed source uh, vector databases. So you can use those vector databases to do this uh, uh, semantic search, basically, to search for documents uh, that are similar to the ones that you have. Um, and they have integrations with uh, lots of models through Langchain. Um, you can um, you can deploy deploy this in um, any platform that has Python. So it's a really useful tool to build. Um, uh, to build your own indexing. So I'm going to show an example uh, now. So this is this code um, is in the repo that is linked to the presentation. But basically, um, this is a tool that we built um, ourselves. It's something that I actually use a lot. So this is a document summarizer. It it uses Langchain, but um, you could implement the same with. Uh, uh, purely with Lama index, but basically you can drop here a, a PDF or give it a URL. So this is, for example, the Linux Foundation newsletter for September, and you can click summarize. Um, so this runs the index. Um, uh, so normally it takes a bit more, just <laughs> so you know, <laughs> but I have it pre-computed, so the it will get the index. So for example, in this case, this whole page, the text of the page has 14,000, so it wouldn't fit in the in the context window for GPT 3.5. That is the one that it uses. So this chunks it, you can see it has 18 requests, requests so it, have, it has done 18 requests uh, for the different chunks of the documents. Um, so this is your summary, and now it gives you here the summary of the web page, so you can see the, the different uh, points that has happened. Sometimes it misses a point or you need more information, but in general it's quite useful. When you have a, an announcement, you want to summarize or even a document that you want to see what's happening here. Um, so this using, is using OpenAI, uh, but you can use any LLM through the integration with Langchain uh, if you want to host your own LLM or do any other implementation. So this is an example. Um, and the code for this is quite simple. You can find it in the GitHub repo uh, uh, if you want to look at it. So let me go. So the other issue uh, you usually find with uh, LLMs is knowledge and capability limitations. Um, to this are two levels. The first level is the fine tuning and, and the, the scope of your LLM. Um, they are limited in what they know and in what they can apply to be applied to. Let's say you have a code, you have a, your own repository, and when you want an LLM to, to comment on your code and tell you what are the errors, well, you have a few options. You either have a incredibly big LLM that has been trained on all the possible code of the world and knows what you're worried about. You fine tune it to know what your code is, or you have used your code as a training data set. Uh, some of their options are obviously possibly costly for uh, the industry or for the everyday user. Um, assume we are individuals just wanting a, a small solution. Um, the, and then the other option, the other limitation, sorry, it's uh, the capability of these LLMs. LLMs are, at the end of the day, are just an stochastic tool that will uh, select the best uh, 
chunk of text to complete a task. They are not real programmers. They don't really know what they are doing. But sometimes in your solution, you would like them to actually execute a piece of code that they are um, suggesting. Or for example, I want them to write a summary of my repository and write that into the readme file. Well, they can't actually interact with the repository. But there comes the agents, and they do that. Yeah, so agents are one of the patterns that um, appear um, to solve these kind of issues. Um, basically, an agent is, uh, is a black box that receives an input, uh, normally a task. So you ask it to give you an answer or to do something. And then the LLM acts as a reasoning engine. So if you look at the prompts that are normally used here, you actually ask the LLM to give you the steps that it would take or the tools that it would use to solve the problem. You then parse that output. Um, you, uh, you parse those actions into tools that are going to implement those actions, and then those tools can actually interact with environments. So you might be able to search for documents, search for, I don't know, search Google for this answer, search the Wikipedia or do any, any other kind of actions that you, uh, that you need, then this information is, goes back to the mm -hmm. LLM, and the LLM needs to now to make the decision, has I reached out the, the solution, or do I need to take more steps or more tools? And then you have the agent basically taking the, the, the LLM, taking the decisions based on the context that you give it. Um, so these agents, it's, it's very interesting, the development of these agents, because uh, you can, you can trace back to the original papers, how it has evolved. So one of the original papers is the MRKL system, so the um, knowledge uh, language systems. So they basically define a system where you have this knowledge engine, and then you have, the, instead of tools, they call them experts that can give you more information about a subject. So that way, your knowledge, uh, your system is actually not trained in, only, in all the information in the world. It's a strain to be very well at reasoning, and then you have these experts giving you more information. You have then the React um, um, agents, that is the reasoning and acting, uh, that is uh, an evolution of these ideas. You actually see in November, Lanchain implementing both systems, the MLK and the React, uh, in this PR. And then, actually, when it got in the media is when you got AutoGPT that implemented it, and you have a lot of people using it to do different things. I mean, you have some crazy uh, stories using AutoGPT to order food or when you didn't have enough in the fridge or things like that. So you have this in the media. So this is kind of the evolution from the research community to actually implementing it in, a, in open source <laughs> tools that have actually adoption. Um, so, yeah, so these are the, the different, some different tools that, are, um, that you can use for app development. So they have, uh, they make your life easier to interact with LLM. So you have uh, agents, chatbots, pipelines, question and answer, but they give you like templates to interact with the tools and they make it very easy to go, let's say that you start with OpenAI because it's the easiest one right now, but then you want to host your own model, it makes it really easy to just change the backend and right. go to your own model. So based on, we are very familiar with Langchain, uh, that's the tool that we have used in most of the examples, but the others are also very good. Mm -hmm. So now we are going to go to an example. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, so just to illustrate the, the limitations, since everybody is uh, familiar with ChatGPT and everybody knows that it's not really good at math, uh, let's just jump into a new chat and ask it to roll a day and see what the answer it is. I bet it's going to be four. You, you can actually so see the history. <laughs> actually a four, and if you see the history, we have a whole history of fours from a random die. That's because Four is, for this uh, model, the actual more uh, statistically uh, probable answer. So it's always going to be four. And if we roll another one, it's probably going to be two, but I'm not going to risk that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just to illustrate how it is just that. It's a completion machine. But what it can do, actually, is 
And these are spoilers for things I wanted to show because we have scrolled down before. <laughs> um, so let's just using, for example, line change um, and using LLM not as the engine that should roll the die, but rather the thinking and writing of instructions of the whole agent. Uh, we can build a Python agent where the LLM will be the sort of the brain that will think, well, uh, instructions for rolling a die using Python would be to uh, use randy in from one to six and print the, print the answer, right? So this is really easy, really. You just have to configure your LLM uh, and pip install LAN chain and create an agent, and there you go. You just use natural language to interact with your agent. This means really uh, any, um, any person who doesn't really know how to code could talk in natural language with his agent and make Python uh, do stuff for him. In this case, let's talk about this example we were talking about. So roll a dice. I don't know if we have run this before, so hopefully yes. Your mouse is really weird, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> so if we run this agent where we just wrote roll a die uh, and print the result, dice for some reason, um, it should, uh, as you can see here, start the agent, and in the agent it will invoke the main tool, which is uh, the Python tool from LangChain, and it would make a query. The query is the LLM writing to a Python console uh, uh, a piece of code which literally uh, asks a random running from one to six and prints the result. The result is three, and now or your LLM is actually able to roll uh, to roll dice. Uh, well, this is a very basic example, but you can go wild. Uh, what is the tenth Fibonacci number? Then it would design a more complex code to calculate it and print the result. And it can operate with everything that Python can really do. But what about more complex tasks? Because this is where agents actually get interesting and uh, are something that can be really powerful in our solutions or even in your day to day. So this new agent, I gave it uh, three tools. We gave it the, the ability to use Python. We gave it the ability to search for files in our uh, directory and the ability to use the shell tool. For example, in this case, it actually uh, went forward and installed the library it needed. Also, there are risks with this. It's going to be able to tamper with your, uh, with your system, so maybe use a container. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this agent now is going to be asked, uh, is there a slides PDF file? Notice how in the prompt I had to actually write the correct path, because otherwise it wouldn't understand that it can search on the whole, uh, on the root system. But given the proper prompt, is able to say, yes, this slide exists. Let's go a little bit uh, forward with the idea and ask it to read that file, to summarize its content, and again, I had to specify to use this library because otherwise it would always try to use pay to PDF. Why? Because that's a, most, a more common pay um, library when you go into Google or Stack Overflow and ask how to read a PDF, so maybe it's not the best one. So always a little bit of insight uh, from the actual developer is needed, so our jobs are safe for now. Um, but yeah, you can see it would, if we make this a scroll event, these are all the steps it made. So the steps are the LLM will, your mouse is really terrible. <laughs> so, the, on green, you can see the step that the LLM thought about doing. So it's in, invoking and it's writing the, the code it would like to, to execute, which is then executed, loading and reading the PDF, which is the slides from this presentation. And then with all that text, the LLM will read it, produce a summary, and print it back to us. Uh, effectively, we just ask uh, in natural language an agent to do that for us, and it did uh, using our system uh, and our, our, our directories. Let's go a step further. There are specific agents for different tasks. There is a pandas agent. Let's say you are a poor data scientist who don't really know how to code, how to code uh, talking for a friend. 
Um, <laughs> you can, let's just load an example data set here and we can set up an agent. This is straightforward for online chain box. You can use pip install line chain, you import, you import it and then you create an agent. You can see here how easy it is. You give it the data frame you have and you give your uh, LLM engine. This, again, we are using for simplicity OpenAI, but it could be any other LLM you have. And then we will try some easy queries. Uh, you can ask in natural language how many rows are in the, in the data frame. It will tell you uh, 150. You can ask in natural language what's the deviation of a column. You can ask uh, what's correlations, any of the usual um, questions that any data analyst would do to a data frame. But we can go further and maybe ask it to do a whole exploratory data analysis. Uh, well, that's uh, a lighter. Um, that markdown is wrong. <laughs> but let's ask it about uh, run, uh, plotting the actual data. It will try to do that. You just have to write, hey, plot me this column against this column, and it will try to do that. Of course, again, as I said before, sometimes the plots are not that good because it's still uh, an LLM trying to, to guess what the best action is. And the most common plot is the line plot, but you can specify just with an extra word, make that a scatter plot, and then you will have a proper plot which gives you a, a valuable insight, or that literally is a nice visualization that you just built by asking a, a robot. Even more uh, a step-to-step -step task is a whole data exploration of the data frame where you can see what his thick thought process is, where it, where it will um, uh, start a chain and do a series of steps trying to uh, explore the data and see what the, the actual shape of it is. It will do a describe, it will do a, an info, it will uh, do correlations, it would even uh, make a box plot, uh, plot on its own of all the columns. So uh, we have now, just out of line chain box, a uh, very capable agent for interacting with uh, or, or that, with a data frame, or even do some simple Python tasks. Now, if you include this in your whole solution uh, with a couple of different uh, agents and giving it more tools, because for example, another very uh, useful tool is to give it access to a search engine where you can have your bot to access the, the tuk tuk search, for example. Um, so it could browse what are the best plots for this data frame or what are the best uh, practices for an EDA, and then it would in, uh, include that in, in, it, in its actions. These, all these uh, are in the repository. We have another extra example. Uh, there is also a very good agent that can interact directly with GitHub, with your repositories, um, with ASIC, with SQL and other type of databases. It's really good. Yeah, so there are a lot of examples. I mean, um, so we will um, show later a few links where, where you can start looking at it. So we have added some information here. Uh, we, we don't want to go too long on this, but this is the evolution of Langchain. Uh, that is the main tool we have used. You can see how it has exploded. Um, and it's still like linear growth, so it's still in the growing phase. So there is a lot of community there. I think they have now built their own platform with Langsmith. Um, so we will need to see how they go with the open source side and now their own platform. Mm. Uh, because we have seen how that's had gone. <laughs> <laughs> a few other um, really good open source uh, libraries and, and platforms that we recommend uh, listed here. Let's not delve into them too much, but Skypilot will uh, allow you to build a framework for rolling your LLMs or well, any other batch job that you have. It will literally standardize your interaction with clouds providers and allow you a nice searching of where is the cheapest virtual machine right now. Um, other useful tools are Psychic, which is uh, an in another layer of interaction uh, which is unified for all your common unstructured data sources. We're talking Notion, Slack, uh, or even Google, Google Drive. Uh, so you don't have to uh, configure your LM for each one of those tasks. Fast chat, that's straightforward. You want to create a bot chat, just out of the box. 
Um, virtual LLM allows you to serve your custom LLM as, a, as an API. An API is the way, for example, uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT works. Uh, most of the applications are now being built around using and consuming uh, ChatGPT as an API, which all the drawbacks that that entail, for example, in prompt drifting or the model changing because it's being constantly retrained and that's out of your control. If you want to to change, to move from that to your own control LLM in your own virtual machine and still consume it as an API, that's one of the best solutions. And finally, uh, we wanted to to highlight these two libraries. I like them especially not because of what they do, which is still impressive, but what, because of the idea behind them, and it's that all the prompt engineering and the development of solutions around LLMs should be test driven. Um, we should be controlling what our prompts uh, make our LLMs to do, what the output is, and how good that output is, and we control it over time. Uh, if you want to change from one LLM to another, want to change the parameters, the size, the fine tuning, uh, you, should do, you should be doing that with uh, the actual um, uh, rigorous uh, measurement of the of the of the development and, and well uh, include that in your development. Um, that's all the tools we have mostly used. There are much more. Um, yeah, we so, have these examples. Yeah, so we have been showing the examples. Um, um, so we're not going to go too deep now. So you have the link here if you want to go to the, or the repository, see the code, or do your own in the end. The, the, what we wanted to transmit here in this call is that there are a lot of tools there. There is a big ecosystem. Um, I think it's really easy to start building your own tools. Like you have seen that toolkit that I showed that I use a lot. It was built in an afternoon. So it's mm -hmm. really easy to start with it. These are a couple of links that I find uh, that they are really good. This awesome LLM and LLM's practical guide. So they are two repos that um, these uh, developers have created. Um, they have uh, basically a list of libraries, papers, uh, other mm -hmm. links that you can use to, to find out more. It's uh, the best place to be up to date. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's also the best place to start, so yes, I mean, Start building your own code and contribute to these platforms. That's the conclusion <laughs> of our talk. <laughs> and I think that's it. Uh, so we have a few more links here if you want to find more information, but I think these, these two are the most useful Slides ones. Slides are in the, in the repository as well. No, thank you. That's it. So any questions, complaints? <laughs> Feedback. <laughs> Uh, I've seen that uh, mostly every time is Python the language being used in all AI, but it's the only one? No, so there are frameworks in most languages, so JavaScript is also another one that is used a lot, but in the end, the main language for data science is Python. Um, I mean, there were some, so we are very familiar with Databricks. So Databricks had some statistics that 80% of the code run in their platform is now Python, even if they started in Scala. So that's an example about how Python has cannibalized yeah. <laughs> the rest of the tools. But you can find tools for um, other languages. So you have, uh, for JavaScript, you have implementation for some of these tools. You have also for .NET. Um, so depending on your platform, you can find. But probably the most uh, advanced and the ones that get the, f uh, the first updates are the Python libraries. Yeah, and besides the model, which is uh, developed in a given language, most of the time you have an API that you consume, you can consume it and build your own solution around it in any language you want, which is a good point. Maybe let's encourage the open source community to not only <laughs> develop those solutions in Python, but actually think about others. Or you can just do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there a way to see the prompts used by the agents? Yep. Yep. Actually, you can see them here. Uh, if 
this is uh, well, uh, there is always an option in, in well in line chain specifically where you give it when you create the the agent you give the option verbose true uh, where am I creating the agent set up the agent here see verbose you set it to true and it will give you a chain of thought and action. So in this case, if you go to an actual query, you can see that the thought is, I need to count the number of rows. So it writes that, so the next uh, code that it's going to write follows that instruction, so it's giving instructions to itself. Then it makes the action, which is uh, using the tool, and the actual prompt is len uh, df. Which, so you can check that what he is doing is actually correct. Also, with line change, you can uh, so you can enable something that is the debug yeah, mode. Yeah, the, the book mode, and it will if you want with line chain. Um, so it would not only show you the actual line of thought from from your point of view, but also what he's doing under the hood, so you understand who is using the LLM and what's the actual prompt being used all the time. It's a bit slow. Line <laughs> chain dot debug equals true. I think it was yeah. So if it runs, and now I run this, it should give you, yeah, you can see, the input, how many rows are there, then it goes into the, you can see the steps, right? Like agent executor, then the, it goes into the chain, then it goes into the OpenAI, and it, hmm. here is the whole prompt. You, this is an open source tool, right? So you can just control click on the code and go and see the prompts. This is really useful when you are building your own LLM, because uh, your own agent or your own solutions, because you see what is a standard mm -hmm. and what works for others, and you can fine tune this to make yeah. your own solution. Um, but yeah, so they, these tools are very transparent because mm -hmm. in the end, it's all prompt engineering for with these tools, and the prompt is the most important mm -hmm. tool to make them do what you want. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, you can reach out to us uh, anytime you want, if you want to have a chat, or we will be around here if you want yeah. to, to talk. Thank you. Thank you.